Good evening. Good evening. Uh, well, welcome to the Environment Committee sponsored program to learn about legislative proposals to reduce plastic and increase our rate of, uh, of uh, recycling in the state of Washington. I also invite you to join us in uh, learning more about how we participate more actively in uh, the legislature through sharing of our opinions. If you recall in our, in our uh, December meeting with the three legislators, they were very, very uh, encouraging to, that they, people need to hear from us. And so at near the end, I'll show a way in which we can do it. You can do it fairly easily. At the, after the question and answer period uh, for uh, our speakers. I'd like to introduce the two speakers. Uh, Pam Clough is here uh, of Environment Washington and Heather Trim, uh, Executive Director of Zero Waste Washington is the other speaker. Heather let me know over the weekend that she was ill and couldn't come but was insistent that she do it, her piece on Zoom. So, there she is. So, <laughs> Pam is an advocate for the uh, environment in Washington, a member of, the, uh, of a member-based advocacy organization uh, whose mission is to protect our air, water, and places we love. She's been doing this public advocacy since 19, uh, 2014. And Heather is the executive director, as I think I mentioned, of Zero Waste Washington. I asked her for other background, so just tell her that. So, <laughs> Pam will begin with a general overview of the state of waste management uh, issue in Washington State. And then Heather, who is the principal, key principal person behind the legislation we're talking about tonight, I mean, the one piece will be mentioning a few others. The RAP Act, which means uh, I've got it here somewhere. Um, we'll think of it later. Uh, we'll present the overall intent and content of the proposed act, and then there will be a question and answer period, and then I will close with my how-to or part of participate with the legislative uh, process. So with that, Adam, or Pam. Hi everyone, Hi. it's so great to be here tonight. Thank you so much for having me, Bill. Thank you so much for the invitation. This is a really beautiful space that you guys all have. Um, uh, I'll jump into it. Uh, Heather, you can jump forward a couple slides. Um, maybe two more. Because we, we covered the intros, and then Bill gave a great overview of our presentation tonight. And we'll, we'll jump to the next slide, which gets into the meat of our content tonight. Are we having a feedback problem? We need to move this. Are you under, uh, I turned it down just a touch, but. Is this better now? Unfortunately, we have a so. No, Okay. Is this, it sounds a little better to me than we're warming up here tonight. <laughs> Great. Um, if there are any other audio issues, just fly at any time. But I probably don't need to say too much about it, but we have a major plastic problem. Um, I'm sure that every person in this room has seen just the, amount, the sheer amount of growth of plastic that we see in our, on our shelves in the environment. And um, I mean, to put numbers behind it, globally there are 33 billion pounds of plastic that enter our marine ecosystems every year. So that has huge impacts on marine wildlife, it has huge impacts on our ecosystems, our communities. And we all see that firsthand here in Washington. Um, the photos on the previous slide and this slide are all photos that have been taken in Washington. On the left, top left here is a photo 
from a river cleanup that was held in Spokane in October. Um, we had seven other uh, cleanup events on one day of action this fall. Um, and we picked up over a thousand pounds of trash on just one day in only seven cities across the state. These other photos are photos that I've taken in some of the most remote corners of Washington State um, on the Olympic Peninsula on two separate backpacking trips. That gigantic pile of trash is actually the result of people going out, hiking out miles to the coastline, picking up and putting the trash there for it to be hauled out via boat, tarp, on people's backs. And so, what I think about when I see all of this is, how do we turn off the tap of plastic pollution? So that's really what we're, we're talking about today. Um, but the next slide shows uh, just the growth of plastic production in megatons from the 1950s to 2015. So uh, the bottom portion of this graph actually is uh, it, pa plastic packaging. So of all the different kinds of uh, materials that plastic is turned into, packaging makes up uh, the bulk of it. In fact, uh, if we go to the next slide, 30% uh, of plastics are, are, is used for packaging. So, next slide. Uh, plastic packaging in particular plays a big role in the challenges that we are seeing with our recycling systems in Washington and really uh, everywhere across the U.S. Uh, but in part because new plastic packaging keeps coming into the market. All of the packaging on, on this slide is using mixed materials. So something that might look like a cardboard package or aluminum can that we're used to putting in the recycle bin might actually be lined with plastic. Uh, the pouches shown in these photos um, are designed with multiple layers of materials. Uh, so maybe multiple kinds of plastics, paper, sometimes metal, and the way that, that this packaging is designed means that it, it cannot be separated and therefore it can't be recycled. Go to the next slide. Uh, there's many other kinds of problematic packaging as well, besides multi-material. Uh, so on the left is, is rigid polystyrene foam. Uh, a lot of people know that as styrofoam. Uh, that breaks apart into tiny pieces and it gets literally everywhere. I'm sure everyone has experienced that unfortunate uh, experience. And so the problem with if it actually gets into recycling facilities, how it breaks into little bits is it can just contaminate all of the other material streams. Um, and that uh, leads to bad outcomes as well. Flexible packaging is all the stuff on the right side of this screen. and. Um, if we go to the next slide, this is what ha happens when these flexible packaging materials get into our recycling system. It wraps around the gears um, that, that move materials through material recovery facilities, and uh, workers at recycling centers will actually need to stop the machinery entirely, go in there, cut it off with scissors or knives, and uh, you can imagine that that whole stoppage of, of the whole systems, that, that is, um, it's expensive. Yeah, and it's inefficient. So all of these problems, let me go to the next slide. All of these problems contribute to Washington's low or stagnant recovery rates. Um, in fact, over 50% of all consumer paper and packaging from municipal recycling is landfilled or incinerated. And another fact that I find interesting too is uh, across the US, Washington actually has one of the better recycling systems. But when you look, and Heather will get to this more later, when you compare to what other countries are doing and what's possible, you know, if we're all failing, <laughs> Let's do better. We, we know we can do better. Um, so, but going back to on the next slide, of all of the plastic waste that is thrown out in our state, only about 16, 17% of it is actually recycled. 
Um, and there's little data on, on what happens to, to these products as well. And so we'll go to the next slide as well. This is problematic uh, for a number of reasons. So one, uh, it's, it's a missed opportunity for uh, to reduce our climate impact. Um, using recycled materials helps reduce the need to extract virgin materials from the earth, um, and thus our climate impact and energy it takes for the production of new materials. If we go to the next slide, um, second, inefficient, material, in, inefficient recycling means that a lot of materials being wasted which has economic impacts, and the amount of paper and packaging that ends up in landfills and incinerators is estimated to be worth $104 million in value. And that's valuable resources that could be going back into this pie chain. Uh, next slide. Um, we, next the inefficiencies with our recycling system, have day-to-day -day impacts on Washingtonians. So, um, more and more packaging uh, entering our homes has made recycling challenging and costly for local governments to operate. And as a result, residents' recycling service bills have increased by up to 30% over the last five years. Next slide. And so, how are local governments reacting? Uh, a few ways, none of them great. Uh, first, uh, Municipalities have uh, reduced materials collected curbside. Um, for, so, for example, Walla Walla, this is a graphic from Walla Walla on the right, the city of Walla Walla on the right side of the screen. And they no longer accept any plastics or glass in their curbside programs. Um, and there are a lot of examples across the state of different cities of no longer accepting certain materials. Uh, Cities have implemented recycling surcharges uh, on residents. Some places like Spokane have uh, reduced collection frequency, and some counties have uh, discontinued curbside recycling altogether. Um, Franklin, College Place, Waitsburg um, are town as well. Next slide. So the result is uneven access to curbside recycling across the state. Only about 50% of uh, Washington municipalities have residential curbside recycling service. And you can see uh, on, this, on this map how that breaks down. Uh, so Puget Sound region, uh, where we are uh, currently, 100% of households have curbside recycling services. But if you go into central Washington, 77% without. Um, and so this impacts rural communities more as well. Next slide. And this is where I turn it over to Heather. So that, that's all the problems, so now we're going to talk about the solutions. Thanks, Thank you. Okay. So um, as Pam was um, talking about, um, we are basically trying to look at our system in Washington and the state Department of Ecology does a terrific report every five years that lets us know how we're doing. And so this is our guidepost. We can quantify how well we're doing in keeping the litter out of the landfill and getting it recycled. Oops. So um, Pam and I are both um, different organizations that are part of the Plastic Free Washington Coalition. And you can see across the bottom the groups that are part of this coalition um, and our goal is to work on the um, plastics and the recycling crisis here in Washington through doing two things, reducing the use of unnecessary plastics, bring your own bag, bring your own coffee cup, and then building markets and restoring our recycling system here in Washington. So one of the things that we worked on a couple years ago was, was the ban of single-use uh, thin plastic carry-on bags at the grocery store. And that took um, many years of working at the local level, and maybe some of you are from some of these cities that you can see on the right, um, where we, we worked with um, city council members and community members to get um, ordinances passed at the local level, and that added up eventually to 37 local jurisdictions, and we did get a plastic bag um, law passed at the state level a couple of years ago. And then um, two years ago, um, Senator Doss 
and uh, Representative Lisbury led the charge on SB 5022, which also looked at plastics. And the part that we want to highlight is that, that this was the strongest poly, expanded polystyrene um, or polystyrene foam ban in the country. Um, so that's styrofoam. So what it did is it, and this is going to start kicking in this year. Um, on the right, you can see that packing peanuts, styrofoam packing peanuts, are going to be banned on June 1. And then on June 1, 2024, uh, styrofoam food containers and styrofoam coolers are going to be banned as well in Washington, the entire state. And as part of that law, it is now already required that if you go to a restaurant um, or even at your own Horizon House, um, you should be asked first before anyone gives you a plastic, uh, any kind of utensils, straws, cold beverage cup lids, or condiment packs. Or they can be out on a container on the counter and you can just um, take as many as you need. And it also, um, that law also um, requires recycled content for plastic, for, for beverage containers so that when you make when you recycle beverage containers or plastic bottles, they should be made into new plastic bottles. That's creating a circular economy here in Washington. So um, let me talk a little bit about our organization. So I'm with Zero Waste Washington. We are a statewide nonprofit. We uh, work to make trash obsolete. Um, so we do this through three ways. We work to um, help pass laws, like um, statewide laws, but also city and county laws. We do research projects and we do pilot projects. This was, this year is, well last, sorry, 2022 was our 40th anniversary. So we were very excited about that. And these are the areas that we work in. Um, and I'm not gonna read them all, but you can see we, that zero waste actually has a pretty broad uh, number of types of topics, ranging from toxic chemicals to plastics to producer responsibility, which is the top right where the manufacturer pays for the end of life of your material. So for example, those are um, cell phones in the top right photo. And right now, if you have an old computer or TV or cell phone, you can take it back to Goodwill or other places and it will be recycled safely here in Washington, paid for by um, the manufacturers. So let me get into now um, policy um, that, uh, that Pam was kind of helping lead us up into. So, um, Senator Rolfus, who is um, from, Bay from Bay Ridge Island and is chair of the Financial Committee, the Ways and Means Committee for um, the Senate, um, passed a, 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 a law three years ago, or 2019, that required a study of what can we do about plastic packaging in Washington State. You don't need to read this entire slide because I have pulled out the top three recommendations from that study. So how do we tackle plastic packaging and recycling? The number one recommendation was to do extended producer responsibility, which I'm going to explain to you in a minute, um, for all packaging, then to do a deposit return system, that's a bottle bill, and then to do recycled content where you're taking the material and you're putting it into the new material. And that was part of what the previous bill did and this, this new bill will do more of. So this idea of extended producer responsibility for packaging and paper has been um, in uh, place in the, uh, globally since the early 1990s. So, you know, more than 30 years. It started in Germany. And you can see all the different colors here of where um, this po policy is in place. But you notice that the United States is gray. We do not have this um, type of program in place. But in the last few years, different um, states have started to really start to work on this. In blue, you can see all the states that have introduced uh, bills along this concept in 1921 and 1922. And then in, 19, in 2021, um, Oregon and Maine passed this, this uh, program or this law. And now just this year, or rather, I keep thinking we're in 2022. Just last year in 2022, Colorado and California we would like to make Washington State number five. Now, what is this? Producer responsibility is where the manufacturers or the companies are responsible for what happens to their products at the end of life. And specifically what this means is that the manufacturers are funding the recycling system. They're funding upgrades to the infrastructure like trucks and, and recycling facilities. They're creating consistent education across the state 
They're setting um, recycling and reuse targets, and they're doing responsible recycling, meaning they're making it safe for workers, and they're not sending it across the seas to be dumped or burned, and they're using recycled materials. So you're creating a circular economy if, the, if, if you get one of these programs in place. Now what this does is it increases the, the accountability for the producers so that they are incentivized to design their products to make them more easily easy to recycle. They're make, you're, we're increasing access to recycling across Washington. We're making it easier to recycle and that it's actually being recycled, all the stuff you put in your bin. And that there's transparency. We can tell where the material is being sent for the end markets. And it's reducing the costs for the local jurisdictions and the residents. And it's reducing the confusion about what is recyclable. You have one list across the entire state. Everyone's recycling the exact same things. Now, another piece, so that's part of the bill that we're talking about, the RAP Act, which I'm building up to now. Um, the, um, the, as I mentioned before, SB 5022 that was um, led by Senator Doss a few years ago required recycled content for beverage containers, um, also um, clean, cleaning products and personal care products and bags. The new bill that we're working on right now includes um, recycled content requirements for thermoform clamshells. That's what those strawberries come in when you go um, get the strawberries at the grocery store. Uh, tubs, like yogurt tubs, single-use cups, cannabis packaging, um, nursery plants, so like the, the pots that you get at the nursery to plant your plants, and um, curbside bins. So all of these will also be incentivized to use the old plastic and make the new plastic in these products. Now, a last piece of the, of the RAP Act, the, the bill that we're talking about, is that um, we'll have a, a bottle bill concept. So the idea is that people would pay 10 cents when they get a beverage container, and then they would um, put their bags, in, their, their bottles and, and beverage containers into a bag that you can see here, a blue bag like this, and then they'll be able to drop it off and the, they'll have an online um, uh, account and they'll get all their money back um, super easy. This is a, the bottle drop um, uh, example from British Columbia, north of here. Um, so that's, and the producers help pay for the system. So this is another form of producer responsibility. Now, um, we have two wonderful champions. On the right is Senator Rolfes, and on the left is Liz Berry. Rep Liz Berry is from Seattle, and Senator Rolfes on the right is from um, Bainbridge Island. And they are going to be the, the champions of the RAP Act, which stands for Washington Recycling and Packaging Act. A really big deal bill, it's an environmental priority for this year, and it's to modernize our recycling and do producer responsibility and the other things that I just talked about. Now, I got this slide out of order, so that's what I meant to say before. All right, so now let's talk about the other bills that we're working on that are zero waste um, here in Washington State coming up in the legislative session. So there's six other bills. This one is um, by uh, Representative Charlotte Mena, who just got elected. Um, in the legislature, she's terrific, and this is to reduce plastic. So we're going to, the, if this bill passes, all new construction would be required to put in refill stations. I hope at Horizon House you have a refill station already in place. That's the photo on the left. And that um, hotels would not be allowed to have the little mini toiletries, they would have the bulk dispensers in the shower. And that um, your floats and docks, and you can see the black floats that are holding up this dock on the photo on the right would not be able to have styrofoam on the inside. Right now, a lot of them, they put styrofoam on. You can see the photo on the bottom. The styrofoam, after about 20 years, these get old and they crack, and the styrofoam leaks out into our environment. And when we do beach cleanups, we see a ton of little things of styrofoam. So this is a very, very big problem. So this is, um, this is a reducing plastic act, and this is um, uh, led by Representative Charlotte Mena. Okay, the second bill that I want to talk about is to make it easier for us to recycle our batteries. Um, batteries are a really big deal, and this is being led by Senator Derek Stanford. Um, the lithium-ion batteries, which are the rechargeable ones, can very easily cause fires when, they get, when the batteries get crushed or dinged when they're being transported. So this is a really, really, really big problem, um, and we want to make it easy for people to recycle all across the state, paid for by the battery manufacturers. 
Now, the next bill is also uh, being championed by Senator Derek Stanford but, and Representative Mia Gregerson. And this is to make it so that you can repair your electronic devices like cell phones or laptops um, or things like that, things that have a screen, um, more easily. The manufacturers would be required to provide to us, the public, but also to the independent um, repair shops, uh, the parts, the um, specs, and the tools that you need to repair um, these uh, devices. So it would be a lot less expensive for us to be able to repair things. And, and for those people who like to do it themselves, it will make it a lot easier for them. I like to repair my own things, but I can't. And I bet many of you do as well. Now, the next bill is being championed by Representative David Hackney, and this is about mercury light bulbs, to ban the sale of mercury light bulbs. And that's what the photo on the left is, although it looks like it, the photo got a little crunched. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the, uh, the mercury light bulbs, which are those fluorescent tubes that you have, um, those, if they break, they are releasing mercury to either you or to the workers who try to recycle them. And also to um, look at all light bulbs in terms of the manufacturers making it easier for us to recycle them. And then finally, um, Rep. Amy Wallen is um, leading a bill which is to make it so that we can look at um, compostable products, uh, food products. So it's super confusing when you have a plastic fork or a um, clamshell, Are you, is it compostable? Can it go in the compost bin? Or does it go in recycling or does it go to garbage? And then what do the different facilities accept? So this is to help clarify, clarify that. So these are a summary of the six bills. The RAP Act, which is the bill to address recycling, plastic pollution reduction, battery recycling, right to repair, phasing out mercury light bulbs, and compostable products. And now I'm going to turn it back to Pam. Thanks, Heather. Uh, that was really, really great. Um, so, Bill will talk more about this in a minute, but it's important for folks who are passionate about um, about zero waste issues and really any issues that Can you take are. Your mask off. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Um, you can make your voice heard, and Bill will talk a little bit more about that. Um, Additionally, we do have, if you are interested in staying in the loop with uh, my work and Heather's work in the Plastic Free Washington Coalition, uh, we do have a Plastic Free Washington grassroots listserv um, and a petition, so I can communicate that to Bill and, and he can make that accessible for the team. But I'll pass it back over to Bill to wrap this up. Well, um before I go into uh, the rest of, of my piece, I think it might be time to stop and ask uh, and allow any questions that you might have of Heather or uh, Pam. Any questions that you have been raised? Uh, you may have mentioned this before, but can you tell me what percentage of the um, recycle that's collected in our curbside bins and here in Horizon House we collect bins, what percentage of that actually ends up in the landfill and what percent goes where it's supposed to go? Well, we did not answer that question, and that is a very good question. So when you put things in the recycle bin, you want that to be actually recycled. And the numbers we're getting is up to 20% um, of that material might not make it through the recycling system. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. One is that people don't always put the right thing in the bin. Um, for example, if you put styrofoam in there, it is, it's garbage. It's going to go to the landfill um, from the recycling center. And if you put things in that are very small, like uh, less than three inches, they fall through. And so those go to the landfill, and, um, and, if, and if you put film in there, it goes to the landfill. So there's a problem of the material that um, they're going to send to the landfill no matter what. And then the other problem is that a lot of things in the recycling facility 
get missorted. They're not sorted uh, by the by the machinery accurately. And so you have a lot of contamination in those bales. And then when those bales, which are these big cubes of material, go to the next step, everything that's not supposed to be there becomes becomes landfill material as well. So it's upwards, it's between, you know, five and twenty percent, depending on the material, is actually not going to make it all the way through the recycling system. <laughs> Very good question. Any other uh, questions before we get into how to help? One's coming. Okay. Uh, I have a question here. Uh, are you working with any of the retail organizations in this state? Such as Costco uses a lot of plastics. Uh, we shop at Trader Joe's, they use a lot of plastics. Uh, it's, it's frustrating that there should be better ways to sell their, uh, sell their produce and so forth. Um, yes, and Pam may be able to add more. So, um, there, if, this, if the RAP Act passes, those retail stores would be um, incentivized to have a lot less wet, um, plastic that comes with the materials. Um, so like Costco, for example, um, and, and other retailers, they would have to pay more for the more packaging they have. So it would be a lot cheaper for them if they just take the packaging off. A lot of things don't even need to have that packaging. They could just make do with a, you know, like maybe a, a, just a single band around something to hold it together. Um, rather than a whole pack, plastic packaging type of thing. So they would be incentivized to have a lot less plastic if this law could pass. Um, the other thing is, is that there's a lot of pressure on the, on the companies right now. So for example, styrofoam. Styrofoam, like when you buy a new computer or a new TV, it has a lot of those styrofoam blocks around it. Well, I was on a webinar about a month ago, and Cisco, which is one of the major companies that makes a lot of things in the United States, although they don't always, um, you can't always tell. Cisco said that in the last two years, they've reduced their styrofoam packaging by 30% um, voluntarily because of all the public pressure against all the plastics. So um, it's kind of a combination of them hearing how upset like you are of all that plastic from the public and also trying to get these new laws passed. Yeah, I think Heather, you really hit the nail on the head. Uh, we are, Environment Washington and, and the many groups that we work with um, in Plastic Free Washington, as well as our, we have state and national partners. Um, Environment America is the national group that we're a part of. And we pursue uh, enacting change through the state legislature, policies like the RAP Act, and we also have members, both here in Washington uh, and with Environment America all across the country that we can activate. And we have also, in uh, addition to our state legislative work, have some corporate campaigns where we help generate that pressure and asking companies and getting people to speak up and asking companies to make better commitments. Um, I also am aware of there's shareholder advocacy, so for instance, that uh, decision from Cisco, or action from Cisco, is a result of uh, grassroots action, but also stakeholder, uh, shareholder advocacy um, that is uh, Green Century Funds is a capital funds management um, company that helps uh, make changes like that. So, great question. Of the landfill, is in Oregon, is that correct? Yes. The landfill for Seattle is in the Columbia River Gorge. It's about 250 miles from here. From How here. much more room is there? By train, yeah. How much more room is there for Oh, our that landfill. Okay, so there's, there's many different landfills to consider. So the landfill that Seattle sends to is actually quite large. It has lots of room left and it's in a very um, arid area, so it um, it has it's a, it's a rural area. There's nothing around it. It's it's got plenty of room to grow. But King County's landfill, which is called the Seattle the Cedar Hills landfill, 
is going to run out of room relatively soon. So you'll see a lot of media articles about that landfill running out of room, our local King County one. But Seattle sends to a different one, the one up in the Columbia River Gorge. I'm familiar with I'm familiar with Ridwell, an organization that collects uh, and presumably recycles some of the materials that you're saying um, aren't recyclable and gum up the machinery and one thing and another. Um, I happen to have access to it through a family member, but I understand that Ridwell does not collect from congregate facilities like ours. So my question about the films and the tiny caps and all that sort of thing is, what is a way for those of us who live in a place like this to recycle those things? Well, that's a really good question. Um, so Ridwell is a disruptor. They are definitely disrupting the market right now by doing their door-to-door um, -door collection. But because they are only collecting very specific things, they're, and they're not doing it through a big recycling um, you know, sorting facility, they don't have the problems of the machinery getting clogged or the things that are less than three inches falling down um, because they're doing it more manually by hand. Um, so that's why they're able to take material that, other, that, that your curbside can't normally take. Um, and that's why they're kind of allowed to do it. They're only allowed to take things that are not actually supposed to go in your curbside bin from a legal perspective. Now, um, so that's part of your, part, answer one is that's the difference with Ridwell. Um, Ridwell comes to your door and you pay, the people who pay for Ridwell, they pay by subscription. They're paying an extra charge to have that convenience of the, of the, of the items being picked up. They also pick up things like winter coats and glasses and cell phones. They pick up things that can then be um, given to nonprofits. So they're providing a big public service by what they're doing. Now, your second part of your question is, what about commercial recycling? Because your building, your, your a Horizon House is going to be a commercial customer. And um, the, the, the way it works for commercial is really, really different. And um, generally, that your, your facility is going to be contracting independently its own um, hauler or, or recycling service to come and pick up everything. And that will be a negotiation between you and them. So this is something that you as residents can influence because you could ask your um, board of directors and your management, you know, what is going in that contract and how is that working? Um, because you could actually have a big influence on that. Now, um, for special things like um, small things that are less than three inches, like for example, lids, you could say, we want to collect those separately. We'll put them in its own box or bin in the lobby, and they could take those away from you separately, take, take those for, for, for you separately, and also film, all the film bags. They could do that too. If you separated them separately and you kept them very clean, um, you could negotiate that with your, your service provider. <laughs> Probably not a very satisfactory answer, but um, the commercial is very different than, than um, residential. Maybe I've missed a link here, but I'm curious. Most of the time that I'm, well, at least it's been my experience that when costs increase because the manufacturing process costs more, they simply pass that cost on. Mm -hmm. with a higher uh, uh, sale point. So how, how is that considered? Yes, that's a very good question. So if we have the manufacturers pay for the recycling system, are they going to pass that cost all on to us? And there was just a report that was issued today that said it's actually a very, very small amount. Relative to the amount of money that, the, that we as consumers are paying for the recycling system right now, it's a very, very, very small amount. And also, the amount is way lower than they are spending on advertising. So we looked at this uh, because we helped get a law passed a few years ago for drugs. So you can do your, your leftover medicine, can go back to the pharmacy, to the drugstore, or the sheriff's office. 
and we looked at the comparison of how much it would cost for them to run a recycling program versus their marketing budget, and it was a fraction of it. It's teeny. Um, they, they, so this is a cost they can internalize, and it does create a level playing field among all the different manufacturers. So uh, it's not like some manufacturers are going to be hit worse than others. And they're going to all maintain their competitive edge in terms of trying to sell you products. So yes, there is, a, there, there is the likelihood that some of that cost, but we're talking a fraction, fractions of pennies, like teeny amount um, relative to the cost that the, the, the rate payers are paying right now for recycling through the, the right now, because all the stuff is so difficult to recycle, actually. Um, Heather, I'll add, uh, yep, thank you. Mass, I'm getting good at this. I'll add that in addition to the study that came out today, when the state of Oregon passed uh, their producer responsibility program, they also conducted a study. They looked at um, the cost of, you know, a basket of goods when you go to the grocery store, and I, I forget exactly how many products they have, but, you know, what would kind of make up a normal trip to the grocery store. And they looked at, they compared the cost of the same exact products from a number of stores in Oregon to um, the cost of those same products in Canada, where they have producer responsibility programs that are running their recycling system. And it's the same, they found the same exact thing as what Heather said, um, fractions of pennies of, of increase. And even some stores uh, that didn't have, uh, so in Oregon, some store that didn't have, um, you know, Oregon didn't have a producer responsibility program at the time, their products were more expensive than some of the products in the stores in British Columbia. So there wasn't a clear pattern um, associated with that as well. Any other questions? Yes, Tom. Uh, Heather, back to the uh, issue of uh, recyclability. Mentioned a number of uh, like five to twenty percent doesn't make it, uh, but what about the other eighty percent that does? Now, how much of that is actually remanufactured, and how much was downcycled into something pretty, pretty basic? Very good question. Well, a lot of it is actually downcycled, but downcycling. What we mean by that is like plastic water bottles or Coke bottles. Those those bottles. That's called PET plastic. And that plastic gets shredded into little shreds, and then um, it's made into um, carpet, mostly. Mostly made into carpet, and also made into some clothing. So it is a downcycling, but it's into durable goods, um, which are, in my mind, not so terrible. We would like them to be made right back into bottles, and that's what this, this new law, 5022, is, is going to require as it kicks in. Um, but, it, but those things are being made into good things. Now, I mean, good, made into somewhat useful things. Now, there are some plastics that are not recyclable back into something because they're toxic, and that is the um, PVC type plastic. And a lot of that has now been phased out by manufacturers. Um, the HDPE, which is the milk jugs and like the, the jug that your detergent comes in, those are largely being recycled into new detergent um, jars already, jugs already. So some of the resins, some of the plastics are being recycled pretty well back into new things. Um, and then there's some that are highly problematic, and those are the ones we want to phase out. For example, styrofoam. That is one we really want to phase out because it goes into um, picture frames and crown molding. And how much crown molding and picture frames do we need? <laughs> so just thinking about some of the foreign countries, foreign countries that used to take plastics and help moving it across to their area. We're sending all our plastic, like our sandwich bags and our uh, the bags that we put our vegetables in and things at the store to the uh, uh, to the dump, so to speak, the landfill. Is burying it 
debris pit containing it so it's not getting out there and bothering other uh, animals and horses in nature. Did, did you, I, mean, I could not hear that question. Yeah. Do you mind, does someone mind um, summarizing that question? I couldn't hear. Your, the question had to do with plastic uh, bags that we use for uh, carrying food and other things. Yeah, and yeah. and what, what do we do about them? What about those, those, those plastics? So those what about film plastic? What can they be made into? Yeah. Is yes. that the question? No, what happens to them? Yes. What, what happens to them? Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, so if your film plastic, which is like your um, your grocery thin plastic bags you bring home, or any plastic that you can you can punch with your finger, so it has a little bit of flex to it, um, which would be like your bread bag or um, like your bags that some clothing come in, you can punch it. It gives a little give. That film can be made into new things. Um, but the film that is crinkly, like the film that comes around your crackers, crackers come in a film and if you try to punch it, it doesn't give, it's a little bit more of a crinkly plastic. That plastic goes to the landfill. But if it's film that has a little bit of gift to it, that you can take back to the grocery store, they have take back bins, and also, um, you know, um, as I was mentioned before, Ridwell will collect those. Those bags are being made into uh, plastic lumber. Um, it's called Trex. And there's also some other companies that do it as well. And what they do is they mix that type of plastic film with um, sawdust, so basically wood waste, and that makes the lumber that you can buy for decking and things like that. Also, that film can be recycled back into plastic bags. So usually that's going to be your garbage bags, like your black or brown bags because there's the color inks that have been on the, the bags and things and so in order they can't really make clear but they can make the trash trash bags. So if you look at your if you next time you buy a box of garbage bags, you will see that they have a lot of recycled content in them. How are we recycling? How are we recycling them? Is the question. I couldn't catch that. How, How are, Wait, what? What is the method of recycling? Yes. Are we putting them the in your, large bags and sending them to the uh, landfill? Or are we sending them in recycle? I don't think our recycle takes those. We have to take them to the store. Yeah, that's what she's <coughs> That's the only way of putting them. So the question, Heather, was if uh, our recycling systems don't accept you know, flexible packaging like films, even if they can, in theory, be recycled, how are they actually get, how can, how can we get them recycled? Does that get your question? Yeah. You know, where, like, where can they be collected? Are there places um, that do, are there municipalities or states or countries that do accept those types of materials? So for the, um, the bags that have a little bit of gift to them and the film, those can go to Fred Meyer and the grocery stores, and those go in the back of the house. They put them in a bale, and they send them off to Reno, Nevada to make Trex lumber or to make new plastic film. Um, the other type of film that's, that's not crinkly cannot be recycled. It's going to landfill. So it's only some of the film that can actually be recycled. Um, it's just the way it is right now. And that's what the RAP Act, so that's the advantage of this new bill, is that it would incentivize those manufacturers to stop giving us stuff that can't be recycled and to make things a lot easier for us. So th these are extremely good questions. These are, th this is the problem with our current system, exactly what you all are asking the questions about. This is a little off topic, but what about silicone? What about silicone? What about silicone? Oh, silicone. <laughs> um, well, um, silicone is not recyclable right now. So if you have a silicone product, like a muffin thing or like a glove, those are going to have to go to the landfill right now. They are not recyclable. We used to buy many things that were wrapped in wax paper or even just paper, which were perfectly acceptable. We used to get crackers 
that, that, that weren't protected by these little stiff plastic things. Okay, maybe one or two of them cracked, um, but uh, did that really matter? It seems That's more right. and more stuff is unnecessarily wrapped in plastic. Oh, why? I agree. You should testify. <laughs> I, I think I understood the question, which is basically we need to go back to the future. Um, there are so many things that were done better, and they've just gone downhill in the last, you know, 20 years. So I may and all, all that extra packaging and all that stuff we don't need and want. <laughs> I may have misunderstood this, but. Uh, I thought you said earlier that glass was being not, not recycled as much. And I wonder what the reason is about that. So the, not, the chart that Pam showed you is for the entire state. Glass is actually very recyclable and is very much recycled in Seattle. Because we have a glass um, manufacturer here in Seattle it's on um, West Marginal Way if you're going um, in um, Soto towards the airport. And um, so they, they are actually um, taking recycled glass and um, melting it down in a huge furnace, very high temperature furnace, and they're making wine bottles. And every day there are 70 trucks that leave that facility. 50 trucks are headed to California to the wineries there and 20 trucks are headed towards the, Cal the, 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 the uh, Washington wineries. And it's a lot um, better to recycle glass into wine bottles rather than use um, virgin sand because you can use a lower temperature and the material is cleaner. So it's really, really good to recycle the glass. But the problem is, is that glass is very heavy. So if you live in Spokane or you live in Aberdeen or you live in um, even Bellingham, the cost to take that recycled glass to Seattle is more expensive than they are willing to pay for right now because of the economics of it. But if this law passes, that will change the dynamic. And what they probably will do is put a um, hub in Spokane um, with a rail car, and they will probably have all the eastern Washington collect all the glass, bring it into that hub, put it in the rail car, when the rail car is full, they'll bring it over to Seattle. So we expect a network of glass recycling if this law passes. In our service room, I separate glass, but I see lots of glass just dumped in to the recycle bins. So what is happening at Horizon House with recycles that include glass with paper and other products. That's right. So the problem with putting um, glass in the recycle bin right now is that when the truck comes around, they crush it. They try to crush the, the recyclables down by 30% so that they can have fewer truck trips in the neighborhood. So it's good for greenhouse gases. But what they're doing is they're breaking the glass into little teeny shards. And those little shards are like little needles. Mm -hmm. And when in the recycling facility, what happens is that glass gets um, like the styrofoam. It gets all over everything. It gets in the paper. And the, when the paper goes to the paper mill to be made into new paper, the glass inside of it acts like sandpaper. And it, it, it um, damages the steel drum that they have that they're trying to, to use to, to um, basically start the process. Um, it's a circulating drum to make the pulp. So glass really is best if it's kept separately when you recycle. It's really good to recycle it, but it's actually best to keep it separate. Um, and in those places, um, in rural areas where people are putting glass in when they're not supposed to, all they're doing at that point is they're, they're putting a landfill. Well, we have some work to do here. Um, on, on that note, if there, uh, we, it's getting on a little bit in terms of time, and so I'd like to thank Heather uh, for her time as well as Pam. Appreciate uh, your responding to the questions. I do have, I would like to take just a few minutes 
to talk about uh, what we can do in terms of supporting it or not, if you don't agree with that, uh, just responding to and having an opinion on various legislation that uh, you have an interest in. And so, uh, well, first of all, the session begins next uh, next Monday, the, the 9th, and it's a, it's a 105 day session, and so it will adjourn in uh, April 24th. So there's plenty of time within that to really uh, process a lot of every bill that goes that is successful has to go through both houses and usually through four committees, two committees in each house, one a policy committee and the other a financial committee. So there's a lot of opportunity in each situation for, that they have to have a public hearing and the public hearing is where we can comment. So uh, next slide please. Uh, we will be looking at uh, a, a broad set of environmental uh, bills. We will probably focus on 10 to 12 bills, uh, and uh, the RAP Act obviously is one of those, and possibly we'll be looking at a few of the others that uh, uh, Heather has mentioned. Uh, we're really concerned about the enabling wind and uh, solar power transmission to be coming to the west of, as a become a real problem of uh, strengthening the grid. So that's another area that we'll be following. There's quite a bit of, re of funding uh, uh, coming through a, a bill that a uh, bill was passed last year that will produce additional revenue, quite a bit of additional revenue. And so we want to make sure that that revenue and that, that uh, those resources are going to carbon reduction product projects. And there's, a, there's quite a bit of uh, interest in zoning for housing density that would allow two to six family apartments in lower density air, uh, neighborhoods near transit. So that's another area we'll be uh, following. And uh, one of the other areas is uh, planning for climate uh, friendly future which is uh, we like to see required in the Growth Management Act that every, every county must develop a plan on. And uh, obviously, uh, pedestrian bicycle safety is another issue that is a concern, um, certainly here elsewhere, and encouraging uh, some funding for some of that uh, activity. And there are others. But what I'd like to do is, uh, uh, is then uh, step on to the next slide, which is basically a, an email. It shows an email that I sent out to the folks who were a part of this last year. This is, an ex this is an example of what I would be sending to you. And you see that uh, I have, they're really, those are supposed to be blue, but it looks like it's red. But anyway, the, the, the first is the, uh, the click on read. House Bill 1814 on expanding community solar projects. That was a bill considered last year. And if you clicked on that, this is you would get a description of the bill and a, uh, a, a short uh, description of what it is this bill will do. Okay, why don't you, um, I would do this for every bill that we would consider. And then why don't you move on to the next slide, please? Yeah. And then the second is, if you click uh, to the second link, um, you get a, the, the ability to provide a response uh, to that after you've looked at the bill and read about it and thought about it. And then you can uh, you, you select what your position would be, it would be pro, con, or other. And then you would be asked to um, provide your first and last name, your email, and uh, organization is really for uh, nonprofits and other organizations. You wouldn't fill anything out there because you're speaking for yourself, not for an organization per se. And uh, your city, state, zip, and the fact that you're not a robot, and then you submit the, re the registration. And that's really what you do for each bill, and you then have also the opportunity, should you wish, uh, this is something I can provide to you, uh, uh, the ability to comment on a bill. 
it takes another step, and I'll be very happy to provide that that uh, a link to you as well. So there, it's it's all possible. It's easy. You do not have to wade through the state's uh, very uh, complex website in, uh, to comment. Although I must add, must add that that has meant a huge increase in participation in this state by allowing all of us to not have to go to Olympia and state our case, not have to write a letter per se, but actually specifically talk about each bill that we're interested in, on either whether we're for it or against it, and why. What are the reasons? That's where the comment comes. So those are all things that we can do and will do. And so we've got a, uh, Carol is sitting there with a set of, uh, uh, Sign up sheets if you have an interest in supporting this. Uh, we'd love to have you do that, and we'll, uh, we would begin to uh, have communication on all these in probably the second week, or the third week in January when the bills begin to be uh, considered and the hearings begin. So, with that, uh, thank you very much uh, for coming tonight. I hope it was uh, informative. Uh, for you, raise some questions, certainly raise some for me in terms of some things we could be doing here. Uh, the environment committee is focused very much on waste management and there is a lot to be done here. So with that said, thank you and good evening.